Today, we have quite an interesting one. We're going to be learning a few add-ons and a few techniques that have been used for other reasons. But today, we're going to be using them to create this. So without any further ado, let's begin. In our default scene, we're actually going to keep the default cube, but we're not going to use it right away. We're going to press Shift A and search for a curve circle, and we're just going to scale it up by something like 20 units. Now we're going to press Tab to go into edit mode, and we're going to go to the segments option over here and click subdivide. Now we're just going to select every alternate point so that we get these four points and then grab them on the z-axis and just move them up by a few units. So something like three units is fine. Now we can press tab to go back into object mode and we can go to the object data properties over here. Once we're here, we can go ahead and increase the resolution to something like 64 and we can change the twist method from minimum to z up. Along with that, we can change the smooth all the way up to one. Once we've set all of that, we can take our camera and press Alt G and Alt R and then rotate it on the X axis by 90 degrees and press enter. Then we can go down to this object constraint properties panel and then add in a follow path constraint. And for the target, we can choose the Bezier circle. After that, if our camera is not lining up, we can go ahead and select follow curve and that way our camera will perfectly align with our curve. And if you actually change the offset, you can see how the camera actually changes its direction along with the curve. Now we can go ahead and keep it at an offset of zero for now while we add in all of the other objects. The next object that we're gonna add is going to be the tori that's gonna go around this. So we can just press Shift A, curve circle, and then go to the object data properties over here. And we can increase the resolution to something like 24. And under geometry, we can go ahead and give it a bevel depth of something like 0 0.02. Now we can rotate it on the x-axis by 90 degrees and then apply two modifiers. The first modifier is going to be an array modifier and we're going to switch off relative offset and keep it as a constant offset and we can change the distance on the x to 0 and the distance on the z to something like 10. Once we're done with that, we can change the fixed count to fit curve and for the curve, we're going to choose our Bezier curve. Now it has the necessary number of rings, as you can see over here, but the rings are not going to follow the curve. To make them follow the curve, you're going to go ahead and add in the second modifier, which is going to be the curve modifier. And for the curve object, we're going to choose our Bezier circle. Now, of course, we have to get the angle right. So the deform axis is actually the Y axis. And that way, we now have all the curves following our Bezier circle. Now we have to make sure that our camera is actually going around the path properly. So we can press zero on our numpad to go into the camera view and then press shift space bar to actually play the animation. Now, nothing happens because we haven't actually keyframed the camera. So let's select the camera, go to the object constraint properties, and on frame zero, we can tap I over the offset to actually add in a keyframe. And then we can go to the last frame of our animation. Now, this is gonna be a 20 second long animation and it's gonna loop. So we're gonna go to frame 600, then have an offset of minus 100. And we're using minus because we tested that going in the positive direction makes the camera go backwards. So if you were to go plus 100, the camera would move backwards like that. But we want the camera to move forward. And so that's why we put minus 100. And then you can go ahead and keyframe that as well by hovering and pressing I or tapping this button. So now the end frame of the animation is 250. So we can fix that by going and setting all of our animation defaults. So we're going to change the frame rate to 30 frames per second. We're going to go ahead and change the end frame to 600. And we're going to change the output directly to wherever we're saving the folder. And the file format can be FFmpeg video and the encoding changed from Matroska to MPEG4 with an output quality of perceptually lossless. Now, if you actually play it, you see it starts off slow and then it slowly speeds up. And that's because our interpolation is Bezier. So we can press T linear and that way we get a linear animation and it's going to perfectly loop. This is what we're currently seeing and we can't tell exactly how good or bad it is because we can see things that are outside the camera. So let's go back to our camera properties and under viewport display, let's change passport out all the way to one and we'll switch off overlays and we'll just take a look at what it looks like. Now, this might be what you're going for, but I think I want a little bit more to be seen. So what I'm going to do is change the focal length from 50 millimeters to something like 25 millimeters. And this is the animation that we get now. And I think this looks absolutely perfect for what I wanted to create. Now, the next thing that we have to do is actually add in some more objects to the scene. And for this, we're going to actually use a built-in add-on that's present in Blender that's really amazing, but not enough people use. So first to enable it, we're going to go to edit preferences and under the add-ons tab, we're going to search for scatter objects. You're going to go ahead and make sure that this button is checked and then you can save preferences, 
and you can close this button. Once you have that set, you can select your Bezier circle and just shift D, Z and just bring it down to below where all of our circles are. And then under the object data properties, we can actually give this a bevel depth of something really small. So 0.01 will do for now. Now we can select our default cube that we had right at the start, then shift select our Bezier circle and then press spacebar to open up your search panel. And in case spacebar does not open it and spacebar is set to actually start the animation, you can press F3 to get this search panel. Once you have your search panel up, you can search for scatter objects and you can select scatter objects. Once you've selected that, press seven to go to the top view, make sure that the entire circle is seen in view, and then just click and draw over the curve just like this. And again, you don't have to be too perfect because it'll fill in the spots for you as well. So just go ahead and add in all of it. And once you're done, press enter and that will actually confirm your selection. And once that's done, your Bezier circle is actually not needed anymore, but we'll keep it for now. The next thing that you want to do is add in a few more of these. So we're going to go to the modifiers properties panel and add in an array modifier. So right now it's set to constant offset, but we don't want that. We want an object offset. We're going to add in an object offset. And for that, we require a new object. So we're going to press shift A, empty, and we're going to start off with in arrows. And we want it to actually scale inward and upward. So we want it to come here. So we're just going to scale it down by a little bit. And we're just going to grab it on the Z by a little bit. So just grab it up a little bit. And then for our modifier object offset, we can choose the object to be our empty. And that's where it currently came. That's absolutely not enough. So we can scale the empty down even more and then grab it on the Z axis even higher. And there it is. Similarly, we can go ahead and add in another empty. So shift A empty and this time we'll maybe make in arrows. Add in another modifier. So this time again, it's going to be an array modifier with the relative offset off and object offset on. And this time for the object, we're gonna choose our empty 001, which we just created. And now with our empty 001 selected, we can scale it up and then grab it on the Z axis and move it up like that as well. So that way, when we actually look through the camera, we should have a bunch of these going on top, some to the right, some to the left, and that's what it currently looks like. So let's just grab it a bit higher on the Z axis. And I also feel like the one at the bottom has to go a bit higher as well. So to do that, we can select our initial empty and just grab it on the Z and just move it a bit higher. So once you're happy with the positioning, this is what it currently should look like. Now we want this to have all the necessary materials. So let's go to our viewport shading of rendered and let's go ahead and set up all of our defaults. So let's go to our render properties, switch on ambient occlusion, bloom, screen space reflections, and also a little bit of motion blur will not harm our scene. Then let's select our forest circles or bezier circles go to our material properties and add in a new material we can change it from principal bsdf to an emission and we can choose whatever color we want so honestly speaking i've done too many with this blue so i'm going to try something slightly new and go with this orangish color for now we're going to increase the strength to something like 20 and that should do then we can actually select our cubes and if we add in a new material to this you'll see it doesn't actually make a difference so we are not going to be doing that. Instead, we're going to have to select our original default cube. And since we're using the default cube, it comes with the default material. Otherwise, we'd have to add in a new material there. So now when we play around with this material, it's going to affect our cube. So what we can do is just reduce the roughness a little bit to get these really nice specular reflections. And along with that, increase the metallic by a little. Let's make the metallic 0.4 and the roughness is 0.25. And that should give it these really nice colors. I also want a light to make all of them actually visible because if we go to the world and set the color down, which is how it's going to be, you can see we can barely tell what they look like. But right now they're visible in this particular frame because our default light is actually present in this area of the scene. So you can see our default light is actually lighting up this region a lot and not really for this region. So this region is going to be really dark. Let's go ahead and select our light and actually press Alt G to clear its location, then grab down the Z and just move it up. And that should light everything up to some extent. However, I think it's best to change it to an area lamp, switch on overlays and just make sure that the area is facing straight down. And then we can scale up the area lamp just so that it's covering our entire object. 
and with that the power seems all right for now or you can play around with the power if required so i'm going to go to the world and actually decrease it all the way to black and just see what it looks like and this looks fine what i'll do is for my area lamp i'm just going to give it a very slight reddish tint or orangish tint let's switch off overlays and this is what we currently have now we have to actually get this to have some sort of a background so that background we can change using the world properties so for that we can click and drag to increase our timeline and change that to the shader editor and from object we can change to world and we're going to do the same technique that we've used in our previous video in case you haven't watched that you can check it right up in the corner over here and we're going to search for a color ramp and a noise texture and we are going to plug the color of the noise texture into the color ramp and we're going to change this white to a very dark orange just to go with our scene so let's make it a nice orange and just reduce the value quite a bit and now we can change the strength as well to something like 0 0.03 or 0 0.3 and plug the color into the color now if nothing is seen go ahead and start increasing the value of the strength and now you can clearly see that there is a small black patch here and it's brighter here so that means it is visible but it's a bit too small so what we'll do is we'll just change our scale to 8 and we'll bring in the black a little bit we'll bring in this orange and in fact we can just brighten this up to make it a little bit more orange so that's what we currently have i'm going to bring in the black a little bit and reduce the scale so we'll make the scale 3 and i'm going to increase the detail to 7 and increase the roughness as well to 0.7 so that should give us our background and once we have our background this is what it currently looks like and I guess that's all right. If we want to see exactly what speed this is going at, we can change this back to the timeline and change the playback from play every frame to frame dropping. And this is going to show us the actual speed that it's currently being rendered at. And this speed seems fairly fast enough. And this is the loop that we have. Beyond this, there's actually a lot more that you can do. You can add in a few particle settings, uh, particle systems as well to have emissive particles. And you could do that by similar methods as seen in this video in the top right corner right now and all of that just helps enhancing the scene for now i think i'm just going to add in a little bit more texture to this cube and we should be done let's select our original default cube change this to the shader editor change this from world to object and i'm going to search for a voronoi texture search for a color ramp as well and now i'm going to take the distance output of the voronoi texture plug that into the factor and i'm just going to bring the black in and control shift click the color ramp with the node wrangler switch on to see what this actually looks like at the moment and this is not exactly what i had in mind and that's because i want to change this from euclidean to chebyshev and that should give me a more sci-fi looking scene so i can bring this back out and that does seem all right however what i will do is search for another voronoi texture and plug the distance from that into the vector of the first voronoi texture change this as well to chebyshev and just play around with the scales so i'll scale this down to one so i finally decided to have a scale of five on the first voronoi and a scale of two on the second voronoi and i brought the black in quite a bit to increase the contrast now this you can either plug into the bump or what i will do is plug it into the roughness and Control shift click this material and it should give you a fairly interesting look it just makes it a little bit more sci-fi and it fits with the scene better i'll also pass this through the bump to give it even more depth so plug the normal into the normal and the color output from the color ramp into the height of the bump. I'm going to press Ctrl S to save this. Of course, I had already tried it once and I'm going to press the plus to just increment it and save Blender file. And in case the bump feels too strong, you can always reduce it. But I think this looks absolutely perfect for what I was imagining. And yeah, this is the scene that we have. You can always check out what your motion blur currently looks like by just rendering out one single frame. That'll also help you see how long it takes for a single frame to render. And that way, I generally choose whether I'll render it out at 4K or HD itself based on the time I have for it to render. And as you can see, the motion blur is a bit too effective in my opinion because everything is completely not visible. So I'm going to go to my motion blur settings and just decrease the shutter to something like 0.2. So now that looks much better in my opinion. The motion blur is present and the effect is really cool. Since I'm happy with my settings, I can go ahead and render out the animation to get this final result. Hopefully you learned something cool from this particular tutorial and you can use this in your own animations and create amazing results. I can't wait to see them, so definitely share them with me. You can use my Instagram or you can comment them 
down below. Stay tuned for future upcoming videos and until they come out, don't forget to stay creative.